Good evening and a warm welcome to the service this evening, those who are in the building and any who may be watching uh, online this evening also. We're going to begin this time of worship by singing to God's praise. We sing uh, the first hymn, which is on the screen, uh, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. So let's stand to sing to God's praise. <laughs> Let's uh, unite our hearts in prayer together. Let's, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this special day, this day that's been set aside and gifted to us as a day where we are commanded to stop work and to find rest in your presence. And we thank you this evening that we are able to come together in this way. And we are able to unite our hearts in praise and prayer. We thank you that we are able to draw near to you in worship, knowing that you will receive us. And we have confidence to draw near. Not because of who we are, but because we come in the name of the Lord Jesus, your Son and our Saviour. And we come not professing that uh, we are those who are, who are righteous and we are those uh, who have sufficient merit to make an approach. We know, Lord, because your word tells us that even our best efforts are as filthy rags before you. So we come not uh, holding up our own good works, but we come resting in the finished work of Christ. We thank you that our faith 
It is not grounded in who we are and what we do, but it's grounded in Jesus and all that he has already done for us. Our hope is is based in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ the solid rock we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And so we thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Father, for your love in sending your Son into this world so that as we believe in him, we have the assurance that we will not perish, but we will enjoy life that is abundant and life that is eternal. We thank you for the gospel message that not only do we see the cross where Jesus died and the the tomb where Jesus' body was laid, the tomb from which Jesus rose from the dead, we thank you that not only do we look back on these events as historical events in, in a place far from here, but we thank you that we see that these events are are connected to us. We thank you that you, Lord Jesus, came to this world to seek and save sinners. And we are sinners as we bow before you tonight. We confess our sin. We confess with the Apostle Paul that the good that we want to do, we so often leave undone. And the evil that we do not want to do, we so often find ourselves returning to. We say with him, what a wretched man, woman, boy, girl I am. Who will rescue me? And we thank you that Christ is the rescuer. He is the saviour. And we pray that our eyes would be upon him. We pray as we sang that you, Lord, would be our vision that you would take our our eyes and our ears and our hearts and that they would be inclined to look and to listen and to rest in the Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would work in us, that you would move in power in this place and in our hearts this evening, that as we sing, we would sing true praise from our hearts. And as we pray, we would be led and guided by you. We pray that as the the word is read, that it would impact us. And that as we meditate upon that word, Lord, that you would speak to us. That you would help us to, to hear and to understand, to believe and to respond in a way that brings glory to your name and salvation and blessing to our souls. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for that invitation to come and to find rest in Jesus. We thank you for a hope that is offered freely to us in and through Jesus. And Lord, we pray that we would be those who don't just believe this and rest in this, but enable us to hear that call, that commission, that went to the disciples all these years ago and rests with us still, a call to go out with the gospel message. Help us, Lord, we pray, to have the courage to go out and to speak about Jesus. We pray for this this place, uh, for Strathpeffer and Dingwall and the, the area that is all around us. We are conscious that that one time The name of Jesus was well known. The gospel of Jesus was understood. And yet today, there are so many who know the name of Jesus only as a curse, who have no grasp of why Jesus came, who have no knowledge of the good news, who have never heard that invitation where God calls sinners such as we are to come and find forgiveness. We pray for people, Lord, like that who who still are in in darkness, who have not heard about the cross, who do not know about the, the resurrection life that is promised to all who believe. We pray for people 
who are going through their lives preoccupied with many, many good things and yet have no sense that when this life ends, there is heaven to gain and hell to shun. We ask, Lord, that you would move in power, that you would awaken the souls of those who are, who are sleeping, that you would put eternity, you have, Lord, put eternity in the hearts of men and women. And yet, we are so quick to suppress the truth of that in this current age. We are so preoccupied with all kinds of devices and plans. And we ask, Lord, that you would move in power, that you would awaken those who are outside of Christ. And Lord, that you would quicken and that you would revive your people. Lord, we confess that often our hearts are, are cold. Often we can be found in a state of lukewarmness. And we pray that you would forgive us, that we would remember the Lord Jesus, that we would repent continually, that we would return to uh, the, the love that we had at first when we, when we believed. We think of the hymn that we often sing, Oh, for a, a closer walk with God. And we pray that we would have that, that close walk with God. Where is the, the blessedness I knew when first I, I knew the Lord, wrote the hymn writer. And we pray for that blessedness that your people, Lord, that we would walk close with you and that we would know the, the blessing of being in your presence. So help us, we pray. Help us to remain in you. Help us, Lord, to, to go out with that message of the gospel, having waited upon you in, in your house on your day. Give us opportunities, we pray, to reach out to those that you put around us in this week. Give us opportunity and courage and wisdom to speak of the hope that is in us and enable us always to do so with gentleness and respect. We pray for those who are reaching out even this evening, to those who may not know Jesus. We think of the, uh, the mission uh, that has been ongoing over the last uh, few days. We pray for Ian McCaskill and others who, uh, will, who will speak and who will praise your name in Ballantour tonight. And we ask, Lord, that you would bless and that you would be, be close to all uh, who gather in the name of Jesus. We ask that the Lord Jesus would be lifted up and many would be drawn to him. And for every effort that this congregation make and all the congregations in the surrounding area, Lord, we pray that you would add your blessing, that you would build your church. So we ask that you would be amongst us this evening, those who are in the building those who are at a distance, many who would desire to be here, but who have no ability, who have no strength to be present. We ask that you would bless them where, where they are. We thank you that you're a God who is not bound by human walls. We pray for others who perhaps have ability and who have opportunity, but have no desire to be in your house. And we ask that you would touch them, that you would create that soul thirst that is quenched only by coming to the Lord Jesus. We pray for the persecuted church, those who would love to be able to meet in the way that we do, but uh, who know that in doing so, uh, they would risk their lives and the lives of their families. So where your people are, are pressed down in various countries, we think of North Korea, we think of India, we pray for Pakistan, Eritrea, parts of China. Lord, there are many nations where to be a Christian uh, costs everything. And we ask, Lord, that uh, you would bless your people. We know that in these places where there is fierce persecution, places like Iran, uh, the gospel is, is moving at pace. There are more and more people uh, who are believing. And we ask that you would bless them. Lord, that you would build your church as you have promised. And we thank you that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We pray for our nation. We pray for those that you have allowed to be in authority over us at this time. 
We thank you that you are the sovereign God. And even though things to us so often look so chaotic and sometimes feel so dark, we thank you that you are still in control and we trust you. We ask, Lord, that you would work in such a way as to bring our repentance to this nation. Lord, that you would turn us back to the book that once we were known for. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you would have mercy on us as individuals and as a nation, that once more we would see uh, much fruit of the gospel in this place. So hear our prayers and continue with us, we ask. We pray for the congregation here. We thank you, Lord, for the unity that they enjoy. We thank you for encouraging meetings over the past few days and weeks. And as they acknowledge you in all their ways, as they look to you as uh, the one who is all wisdom, who is the guide, who gives vision, we pray, Lord, that you would guide them, that you would direct them, that there would be unity, that there would be clarity, and that in your time, uh, this pulpit would be filled with the man of your choosing. So, Lord, bless them, we pray. Bless us. Hear our prayers. Cleanse us from sin and enable us to be in the Spirit on your day, worshipping you in spirit and in truth. And we ask all this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We will sing again to God's praise. And this time uh, we're singing from the Psalms. Uh, Psalm 145, the traditional uh, version of the Psalm, second version. O Lord, thou art my God and King, thee will I magnify and praise. I will thee bless and gladly sing unto thy holy name always. And we sing verses 1 to verse 6, and then verses 17 and 18. And we'll stand to sing to God's praise.
If you could turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, it's on page 988 of the Bible I have in the pulpit here. And the words are also on the screen. We're reading from verse 28 of Matthew 20 through until verse 16 of Matthew 21. This is God's word. And I'm reading, I'll read from uh, halfway through verse 28. Uh, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. But they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately, they received their sight and followed him. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her coat by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large, large crowd spread their cloaks in the road while Others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple court, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. Amen. And may God bless that reading of his word to us. We're going to prayerfully sing again that, uh, that uh, prayerful hymn as we come uh, back to God's word. Uh, speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let's pray just for a moment as we turn back to the passage that we read. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word and we pray as we have sung that you would speak to us, Lord, that we would be those who are ready to receive the food of your word. We pray that you would help us to to receive that truth, that you would plant the truth of your word deep uh, in our hearts and that you would sanctify us, that we would be shaped and that we would be fashioned into the likeness of the Lord Jesus. And we ask now, Lord, that as we look briefly at a passage that we've probably looked at many times before, help us, we pray, to, to see and to marvel and to worship as we Look at the character of uh, King Jesus. Help us, we pray, to bow before him and to give to him all the praise and the glory that he is due. So guide us and lead us, we pray, as we take these moments to, to receive your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. For the first time in over 70 years in this nation, we have a, we have a king. And uh, you couldn't escape that uh, truth because it's been on the news broadcasts uh, very frequently over the last uh, few weeks. Uh, and just was it last Saturday, a uh, week yesterday, we, we witnessed this this uh, great ceremony as uh, we saw the coronation of the king. But tonight we're not talking about King Charles. Uh, tonight our focus as we look at Matthew chapter 20 into 21 is, is on King Jesus. And in Matthew's gospel, uh, you'll know that there is that recurring emphasis on the fact that, that Jesus is king. And as we see Matthew uh, walk us through the, the ministry of Jesus, what we're seeing is how the kingdom of God came near in the ministry, in the work, in the witness of, of Jesus. And even in the, the short section that we, we read, there is that recurring emphasis on the fact that, that Jesus is king. Uh, we see three times in, in uh, these two chapters uh, the title Son of David being used. Uh, verse 29 of chapter 20, and then verses 9 and verse 15 of uh, chapter 21. Son of David, that title is, is attributed to, to Jesus, and that's a royal title. That's telling us that Jesus is king. He's been recognized as, as king. And then in, in verse 5 of of uh, chapter 21, there is that exhortation, uh, see, or as it has it in the older versions, uh, behold, your king comes to you. So Matthew is, is telling us in this section that Jesus is king. And in all the, the drama and the excitement of Matthew 21, the, the commentators, the scholars, they, they tell us that this scene it looks a lot like the coronation of the king, the coronation of King Jesus. And what I'd like to do tonight in the, the time uh, that we have is, is just think for a few moments about the nature of King Jesus. Let's just consider for a short time what kind of king he is. And Rather than taking two or three points and digging down a little into them, what I'm going to do is just spend a, a short amount of time on a, a whole load of points. So I actually have nine points, just for your discouragement. <laughs> um, but uh, we'll move through these points briskly, and we'll finish round about the hour. But the first thing that we see as we look at this passage and as we think about the kind of king Jesus is, uh, we see that Jesus is a king who is near. He's a king who is near. 
to his people. And let's just step through the verses, verse 29 and verse 30 of, of chapter 20. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus, the King, he is near enough to hear them. They are near enough to shout out with expectation that, that he will respond. Now, just a few years ago in, in Harris, uh, Charles, the, the, the prince as he was then, he, he came for a visit to Harris, and there was a few very carefully selected people and very carefully vetted people who got near to the prince. But for most people, even if they really wanted to get near to him, they couldn't get anywhere near him because there was security that were holding them back. And now that he's gone from being prince to king, he's even less accessible. But Jesus, who is the king of kings, what we see here in this section is that he is near to the people. And as we think about the, the, the gospel uh, message broadly, we see in the gospel message that, that Jesus, he, he left heaven to come to this earth to be near to his people. Think about John chapter 1, verse 14. The word, Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And here we see Jesus, and he's, he's right in the middle of this large crowd. He doesn't have the disciples pushing everybody back. He's right in the, the center of this, this large crowd. He's surrounded by people with many needs, and Jesus is near enough for them to cry out to him and to seek him. And one truth that we can, that we can rejoice in tonight is that, is that Jesus, he is still near to us. Wherever we are, even if just two or three of us were meeting in this place, we have the assurance that he is near. Uh, we, we sang it in the, the last uh, two stanzas of the, of the psalm, Psalm 145, verses 18 and 19. It says, The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him he hears their cry and saves them. And these two blind men, they called out to Jesus because they knew that Jesus was near. And this was their opportunity. This was, their, this was actually their last chance. They didn't know that. But this was their last chance to cry out to Jesus. He, he would never pass through Jericho again. And so they had the chance. They took the chance. They called out to the king who was near. And so tonight, uh, the application for us is, is straightforward. Are, are we calling out to the king who is near to us? Maybe there's someone here tonight uh, who isn't yet saved. Why not call out even now to the king who is near and who is mighty to save? All of us uh, are in need of sustaining grace. It comes in daily packages. But we have to call out to the Lord Jesus to, to give that grace to us. Some of us are, are struggling. We need help with this. We need help with that. We're anxious. We're confused. We may have burdens that feel heavy. What are we to do? We call out to the King who is near. When we're struggling, we don't know which way to go. What do we do? 
we acknowledge the Lord. We, we call out to the King, who, who is our vision, who is our wisdom, that we are to look to. So the first thing we see here is that Jesus is the King who is near. The second thing we see is that Jesus is the King who is, who is merciful. Verse 30. When they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Now, what is mercy? Well, my favorite definition of, of mercy is, is sung by our, our children in the Sunday school week by week. They, they sing a song. Um, I'm not going to sing the tunes. I'm not, I'm not great with that. But the, the, the lyrics go, grace is when God gives us the things we don't deserve. Forgiveness, peace, joy, all these things. Mercy is when God does not give us what we deserve. And the men who are crying out here, they're crying out for mercy. And in doing that, they're demonstrating the truth that they, they knew they were sinners. In asking for mercy, they're, they're confessing their sin and they believed that Jesus, this king who was near, he would show them mercy. And when we just hit pause for a moment, moment and we, we think about where Jesus is in terms of his ministry, the whole reason that Jesus was in that place was because of mercy. Jesus, at this point, he's, he's passing through Jericho, but he's headed for Jerusalem. Why is he heading to Jerusalem? Because he is on a, a, a ministry of, of mercy that would take him all the way to the cross. Jesus would face the wrath of God that their sin and our sin deserved when he reached Jerusalem, when he was lifted to that cross. And he did this so that they and so that we could be shown mercy. But like these men, we have to ask for it. So take the application. Have you and I cried out yet for mercy? Have we cried out this simple prayer? Jesus, have mercy on me. Because that's a saving prayer. And that's a prayer that the Lord Jesus will, will always hear. No matter how big the crowd is, one sinner who cries out, Lord, have mercy on me, that prayer will be heard. That prayer will be answered. So we see a king who is near. We see a king who is merciful. We see, thirdly, a king who listens. Verse 31 the crowd rebuked them, that's the, the men, and told them to be quiet. But they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. So we can just imagine the, the picture as Matthew paints it. Uh, the, the crowds uh, are, are thick. There's a buzz within the crowd, and there's these, these two men, and they're they're making a scene. They're, they're, they're shouting out. They're trying to get the attention of Jesus over everyone else. And, and the crowds tell these men, be quiet. They try to shush them. He hasn't got time for you, they're told. He isn't going to listen to you. Look at all the people. But they kept on calling. And Jesus, he, he, he did listen. He's the, he's the king uh, who listens. And Jesus listens to these two men as if they were the only two men in the place. He listens to them and they are given his undivided attention. And so we see the king who listens and he listened then, and he still listens tonight. And we look back then, 
and we see a crowd, we see these two men in a culture uh, that is, is trying to tell them to be quiet about Jesus. They're in a culture that's hostile and a, a culture that's trying to encourage them uh, not to talk about Jesus and not to talk to Jesus. You're wasting your time, says the culture. And our culture is not much different. The pressures they faced on that day, we feel on this day. So these two men are an example to us of what we should do. We should cry out to Jesus and not listen to the crowd. Keep calling out to Jesus because he is the king who listens to us. The fourth point, he's the king who serves. And that's where we began the reading tonight in verse 28. Uh, Jesus uh, says, the son of man, the title that he used for himself most commonly, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what Jesus said. That's what he preached. And that's also what he practiced. Because when we fast forward from verse 28 through to verse 32, uh, we see Jesus and he says to these two men, how can I serve you? Jesus stopped, verse 32, and called them. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. It's a, it's a remarkable scene. Two men, two faces in a vast crowd, and two men who in that culture would have been considered to be, to be nobodies. And they're standing before the King of glory, and He serves them. He, the King of kings, says to these two men, what do you want me to do for you? And that's the question that, that still comes to us uh, tonight from, from Jesus. He, he says to us through the word, what do you want me to do for you? He's the same Lord who can cause the, the, the scales of sin to fall from our eyes. We may not have physical blindness, but we are born with spiritual blindness. But one touch from Jesus, and we can see, as the hymn goes, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind but now I see. He's the king who served, and he's the king who still serves. As we say to him, have mercy on me. I want to see. Fifthly, he's the king who is powerful. Now, today, our kings and monarchs, they don't actually have all that much power to, to do things. The power has shifted to politics rather than, than uh, royal families. But, but this king, King Jesus, he is powerful. Verse 34, Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes Immediately, they received their sight and followed him. So one touch, and they can see. There isn't a doctor, there isn't a, an optometrist anywhere who can affect this. But one touch from Jesus and these blind, blind men, they, they, they have sight. 
such as the power of, of Jesus. And we see that power of King Jesus throughout the Gospels. Uh, think about this. One touch from Jesus and disease and demons, they have to flee. One word from Jesus in a storm, and the sea is calm. And when you live in Harris and you see the sea, you understand just the, the immensity and the power of Jesus. One word, and the sea is stilled. Jesus is a powerful king. I'm reminded of the, the words of a, of a song that a, a guy, a Christian songwriter called Steph McLeod sang. He was a guy who lost his way, his life turned bad with drink and drugs. He found himself living uh, on the street. He was homeless and uh, somebody reached out to him in Jesus' name and shared the gospel with him and he heard, he believed and he was saved and uh, he is still walking with the Lord but in his in his song, um, which is a testimony, when I, call, when I found Jesus, it's called, uh, there's one lyric in it, and uh, he says in the song, one touch from the King of Kings changed everything. And that was the message way back then, and that is the message still today. One touch from the King of Kings changes everything. Jesus is the king who is powerful. Sixthly, he's the king who, who knows. He knows what's happening. He knows what's up ahead. We touched on this a little this morning, but we, we see this as we move into the next chapter, at verse, 20, at verse uh, 1 of chapter 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there <coughs> with her coat by her. <coughs> Excuse me. And tie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. So we see in this scenario that, that Jesus, he's, he's fully aware of what's going on. And the scholars debate uh, as to whether this is a kind of supernatural foreknowledge uh, or whether there's a, a, a plan that has been prearranged. It doesn't really matter. But either way, we can see that, that Jesus knows what's going on. He, he knows what's up ahead. He, he knows about this coronation scene that he's about to be at the center of that was prophesied in Zechariah chapter 9. And Jesus knows that the, the crowds will move very quickly uh, from, from coronation to demanding crucifixion. And yet still he goes on. He goes on in this mercy ministry. He heads to Jerusalem on this mission to, to seek and to, to save sinners. He knows, he is fully aware, nothing is catching him by but by surprise here, he's fully aware. He, he, he knows what's going on. J.C. Ryle says, there is nothing hidden from the Lord's eyes. There are no secrets with him. Alone or in company, by night or by day, in private or in public, he is acquainted with all our ways. He knew what was going on back then. He knows what's going on today. He knows what's going on in your heart. He knows what's going on in mine. And still, he reaches out to us in love and grace and mercy. The king who knows. The king, verse uh, seventhly, uh, who, who, is, who is humble. Verses four and five. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foe of a donkey. 
We just see the humility of Jesus here in the scene. And even though we contrast this with what we saw on our televisions a week or so ago, there was such pomp and ceremony in the coronation scene. And that's just a small king of a small country who's in power for a, a small time. But this king, Jesus, the king of kings, the eternal king whose, whose throne is, is forever, he doesn't gallop into Jericho on a white stallion with a huge entourage. There's no pomp, there's no ceremony. He comes humbly, riding on a, a donkey. We see the, the humility of, of King Jesus. Uh, he's the, the king that, that Paul wrote of in Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 8, that the apostle Paul, speaking of Jesus, says uh, that uh, he, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in, his, in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and be, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He's the king who is humble. The next point that we see here is that he is the king who is gentle. And it's just a, a small detail here, but it's a detail which is in for a reason. Verses 6 and 7, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. It's just a, a small donkey, but it's, it's only Matthew who records this. Matthew tells us here in this account of the, of the scene that there were actually two donkeys. The other gospel writers tell us about one of the donkeys, but Matthew tells us that there was actually a young colt and her mother. And Mark tells us in Mark 11 and verse 2 that this young colt had never been ridden before. So for this young animal, this was a stressful day. All the noise all the drama of the scene. And so what does Jesus do? He takes the mother on scene with the young colt. And we see something in the, the small fine details of the gentleness and the considerateness, the sensitivity of Jesus even towards this animal. We might ask, why do we why do we need to know this? And I think the reason we need to know this is because Jesus wants us to, he wants us to come to him. He wants us to trust him. Matthew 11, verse 28 and 29, come to me, says Jesus, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So we see the gentleness of King Jesus. And finally, we see the, the strength of King Jesus. He is the, the King who is strong. And there's a, a change in gear in this last section. Jesus entered the temple area, verse 12, and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. And it's quite a scene. We can imagine the, the scene, the, these tables in the, in the temple area uh, 
full of merchandise, heavy laden with, with goods for selling. And Jesus walks in, he looks around, and in a movement, flips them. And the people in the temple area, they, they, were the, the powerful, they were the powerful religious leaders. They were the feared people. And they were in cahoots with these, these confident market traders. So these people were no pushover. And yet Jesus, with great ease, he drives them out. Merchandise everywhere. Tables upended. The most powerful guys in that place on that day, driven out of the area. And so we see the, the strength of King Jesus. He is firm. Uh, he is strong as he deals with the, the, the proud religious leaders and the greedy sellers. But he is gentle with the, the vulnerable, with the blind, with the outcast, even with the, the, the nervous cold. And we could go on, but my time is gone. And so I want to, to just stop there and ask the question, have you ever known a king has there ever been a king like this? A king who is gentle and humble and powerful and yet approachable and loving and merciful. A king who, who loved his, his people so much that he left the throne of heaven to come to this earth to save them. And a king who would save them, a king who would save us, not by taking up the sword and swinging it with force, but by laying laying down his life and shedding his blood. This is our king. This is King Jesus. And so let us be encouraged as we finish to put our faith in him, to worship him, to lift up his name, to give him the glory that he is due. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once more for the glory and the power and the mercy and the majesty and the grace and the gentleness and the humility and the beauty that we see in your Son. We thank you that he is the Lord of Lords. We thank you that he is the King of Kings. We thank you that he is the one who hears us as we cry out, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. We thank you that we are promised forgiveness. We are promised salvation as we put our faith in him. So help us, Lord, we pray to trust in Jesus. We glance even at the reactions to Jesus in that passage. Uh, we see the crowds excited one moment, and yet within days they have turned against Jesus. We know that to have a reaction in our emotions is not enough to save us. We see religious leaders who are so learned, who know so much of the Bible, who have so much in the way of orthodoxy in them, and yet who are indignant and who will not bow the knee to King Jesus. 
Help us, Lord, we pray not to be like them. Help us to be like these blind men who cried out, have mercy on me. Help us to be like the little children who praised the Lord Jesus with the simplicity of heart. to hear our prayers and enable us as we go from here to go with hearts that are full of love for you and wills that are determined to live lives that please you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll sing to conclude the last three verses of Psalm 72. Psalm 72, his name forever shall and you are last, like the sun it shall, men shall be blessed in him and blessed, all nations shall him call. We'll stand to sing to God's praise. <clears throat> grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit, be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.